today I'll be telling you about tools of our trade, try to squeeze in a brief overview of microscopes, grids, and more. And the reason why I'll try to be brief is we'll see it in person in the afternoon, if not late in the morning. So in terms of single particle, what are we thinking about? We're looking at this workflow. Within a day, we can start collecting data, start processing, and attain a near atomic resolution structure. My definition would be uh, sub two, and that's near atomic in my mind. When did we first get an electron microscope? In the 1930s, there were ideas about the electron microscope, and Ruska and Nils started building one. If you go to the Nobel Prize feeds, you can see that there was a Nobel Prize for Physics awarded for the electron microscope. And you can see some of the early designs, and you can also see some of the early images coming off of that. So that was the 30s. A lot of structural biology techniques started around the middle of the 1900s. Why did it take so long for EM to catch up, as it were, to other structural biology modalities? There is a term that people call the resolution revolution. And the idea is that not until a certain time period or a certain event did EM really break a barrier that became useful for structural biologists. And that in the early 2010s with the direct detectors. There are a lot of hardware improvements that came along with that. Microscopes were more stable, computation got cheaper, but the direct detectors is noted as one of these watershed moments to really take an existing microscope and extend the capability. Now, it's not just direct detectors alone, not just hardware alone. Software was very important. Automation started coming in to make use of the direct detectors and be able to shape how you're acquiring images and collecting the data, and also processing that in a streamlined workflow. So Kim sort of touched upon the early package that he made, Spider, and uh, the idea was that it was modular in the sense that you can go in and out of the workflow depending on what you're trying to do. It is not known that one module is the best module for you to use. As software development has proceeded, there are certain uh, workflows that are very useful but may or may not be optimized for your uh, research. So what can we do with the combination of this hardware and software? We have been able to extend and approach certain resolution regimes we would have not otherwise, as well as been able to tackle problems that are more complicated. You may have heard about the GPCRs not too long ago. That, in that terms of data collection, required a lot of images, and only a few of them were used in some of the maps. It's not to say that 5% was used in a particular reconstruction, the other 95% are garbage or particles that are wanted, so to speak. It might just be for their biological question, 5% was what they're going after. In terms of identity, you might have run mass spec or a SDS based shell, the other 95 could be the protein of interest or an active molecule of interest. It could be just in the confirmation or it could be a complex falling apart that we can't really discern. Now, some programs have been trying to attempt at that, for example, ribosome biogenesis, where you actually have different complexes in the stage, and in different stages, and different populations. So then that's trying to get at the other 95%. So if your resolution is only the criteria you use, that's where you might not use 80% of your particles and concentrate on 20% or 10%. But if you're after transition states, biochemistry pathways, you'll have to start addressing this other group, and how do you interrogate that? Joachim also alluded to a little bit, and I tried to prompt him, manifold embedding. So what happens if you just don't have one conformational state or two conformational states, which are pretty easy to sort, but a continuum of conformational states? And that becomes a lot harder because we'll have to start binning your data, and you'll need a lot of data to get the statistics. So then these are our questions before us. We want to also be able to have interpretable models and have a gallery, something like this, that is not only pretty to look at, but informative. And we also want to extend it beyond macromolecules 
and go in situ into a cell and do the same thing. Now to know where we're going, we know, need to know where we are right now. And we need to know where EM fits in the context within biology. Sometimes you may see a illustration like this indicating that an electron microscope is a microscope. You can span actually atomic resolution all the way to microns, even millimeters with an electron microscope. This figure is not to say that electron microscopy replaces other modalities. It will then highlight where you would want to use them in concert and in conjunction. And also something to make note that although electron microscope can access these resolution regimes, you have to prepare your sample in a particular way. And you saw a little bit of that yesterday. So just because I can prepare a tissue does not mean that I can use that same preparation to go to atomic resolution. Maybe, maybe not, depending on what your goals are. And not only the hardware, but the preparation of your sample will greatly affect the resolution regimes you can achieve. Okay, so we have an electron microscope, that's our tool of choice, but let's take a step back, why electrons? So there are certain pros and there are certain cons. Pros, small wavelength. We can get picometer wavelengths with electrons. And so then definitely that's why we can say we can get atomic resolution. That wavelength is perfectly suitable. Also, it can be focused, which is really good because you want you know, a nice focused image, a clear, crisp image. What are certain problems? Well, electrons have a lot of energy and they can damage your sample quite a bit. Also, it has very poor penetration. You, I'll talk about this sh shortly, but you might notice that we have a, a vacuum in the microscope. If we had air in the microscope and we shot an electron, you wouldn't really get too far, maybe a few centimeters, and you would have a lot of energy dispersed. That would generate a lot of heat, and that could be very catastrophic, if not destructive. Well, it won't be an explosion, but electronics and everything else, it'd be, if you're, uh, your hardware manager would be crying. <laughs> so here's another illustration of what happens and sort of jumping a little bit. So, so this is what someone has looked at. If you go to Grand Jensen's lectures, you can see images of, let's say you're at liquid nitrogen temperatures or liquid helium temperatures, and you start sending electrons down and hitting samples. As you get more and more dose, you get more signal, but you have destruction of your sample. And during the round table, we can talk about what's the effective dose or what an ideal dose for EM may be. Some people say you can get into the tens. Some people say, why not collect 200 and you can just data shape it later. And Bob Glazer has also looked at this. So there's a few uh, references. So all, this, all these slides will be posted online and therefore you can look in more into this if this is of interest of what KV, what dose. You know. So now we have electrons and that's our source. I like to liken a transmission electron microscope in the middle to a light microscope. Our light bulb, as it were, is some sort of electron source. As I said, we can focus our electrons. So we have lenses, magnets are our lenses, just like glass lenses are useful for a light microscope. Glass can bend light, magnets can bend electrons. We have a sample. So normally in a light microscope, you might have a glass slide. Our sample is put in a form factor of a three millimeter metal mesh. We call it a grid. Some of the older microscopes actually do have eyepieces and oculars, and you can twiddle your know, magnification, uh, your focus, etc. More of the modern microscopes have cameras. Both light and electron microscopes also have cameras. So it's just the idea of are you physically looking through your eyes or are you making use of, of a digitized form? But you can see a transmission electron microscope and a light microscope is very similar. So if you understand the physics of optics, then electron optics are very similar. Now, it does get a little bit more complicated because a, a lens is not one lens, it's a compound lens. So you have a lot more lens coils to make up what we might consider a condenser lens or the objective lens. We have projection lenses so we can put it on a detector. 
But the four main points I want to get across as we start looking at an electron microscope, and then when you go down to the practical later, is that you have to understand your electron source, vacuum system, lenses, and detectors. And there's actually a fifth consideration, but that's more on the maintenance side. But if you keep in mind these four systems, you can approach a microscope and be better prepared. Most likely you won't be aligning a microscope. You might not be touching a microscope in particular ways, but you would want to know if a microscope is useful, if it's in a condition that's only good for screening or it's perfect for data collection. So what are the three sources that we normally use? What is our light bulb? Our sources tend to be made out of tungsten. Tungsten's pretty good because you can heat it up quite a bit. It can go to oh, over 3000 degrees Celsius. Actually, if you uh, stay and you were inquiring about our gold grid making, we use tungsten as a support to heat up gold and evaporate gold. Uh, but besides this context of tungsten is that we typically can heat up a tungsten filament like a light bulb and we can extract electrons or actually it sends out electrons. There are a couple other categories of sources that people use. A crystal could be lanthanum hexaboride uh, or uh, what's in a field of mission gun, a tungsten tip. And below are pictures of a tungsten filament, uh, lab six filament, and a field of mission gun, the tip. So in terms of electrons, there's something known as a work function. You have to do work to extract electrons. I usually use a rule of 10, maybe a rule of 10 sort of applies. Like, so a tungsten filament, you can, you can use on the order of you know, maybe hundreds of hours, um, lab six, maybe thousands of hours, uh, tungsten field emission guns, maybe you know, tens of thousands of hours. So uh, a tungsten filament would not be surprising if it's heavily used to change it every quarter um, or a lab six, somewhere around there, you know, quarter half, half a year. Field emission guns, we don't expect to change annually. It can be changed annually, but some of our uh, FEGs have lasted years. So I would liken it to once a FEG is on, it's always on and you keep it on versus these filaments, you would only turn on when you need it because what you're doing is you're doing work, you're pulling off electrons and eventually the reservoir will go away. Like a tip, the filament could break, lapse a crystal. Uh, some of them, when we use a completion, uh, the middle figure, uh, it just goes down to almost nothing. So eventually that reservoir electrons will go. I won't go over the math, but if you, there's this nice YouTube video of saying like, well, how fast can electrons go? Even five kV. So usually some of our XFEGs are thermionically assisted where you know, we have an extraction voltage of a few thousand volts and that's already going, I don't know, somewhere on the order of a 10th of speed of light. I think I, I was quoted that if we're roughly around 200 kV, we're half the speed of light and um, 300 kV, we're approaching two thirds the speed of light, give or take. So that's all a fast moving electron. We have used different types of acceleration voltages in our microscope. Part of that has to do with price point, maintenance, and also use. Typically, when we're using somewhere along the lines of 80 to 100 kV, uh, we're using a tungsten filament or a lab six. There are now 100 kV FEGs out there. Uh, the goal for these microscopes, they tend to be side entry microscopes. They give you very high contrast. The vacuum uh, requirements for these are a little bit lower, so they are a little bit more robust. Great for training. Uh, one of our microscopes, uh, a 1200 series from Joel, we've crashed it, the vacuum many times. We've burned out the filament quite a bit. We've actually had oil go straight through the column and it still is pumping two decades later. So it's a really, so some of these form factors can be extremely robust, easy to maintain relatively and a lot of the parts are off the shelf. We only expect sub nanometer resolution or the way that we uh, have these microscopes because we don't tend to cite them in rooms 
that are like our Creos rooms that we showed you yesterday with an anti-vibration table, the EMI cancellation system, right? But some of these microscopes, especially for material science, can go quite well and can go quite high in terms of reliability and resolution ranges. 200 kV in recent history to me seems to be like a, a workhorse type of kV. You can do quite a bit. You can do data collection, you can do screening. These microscopes can be side entry. A lot more of them now have some sort of multi-loader, auto-loader system. Um, FEGS, of course. And the resolution you can get would be you know, sub four. You can aspirationally get even further if it's sighted in a good environment and, and you really, really align it. Um, I misspelled Arctica, but the Arctica can go you know, in the twos. 300 kV, this is the instrument that is really widely thought for data collection. The CryArm 300, the Krios is at this kV. Uh, and this is where a lot of the you know, one to three angstrom reconstructions are coming from. And it's becoming more and more routine. I won't know, I don't say that's necessarily easy, but there are certain things in the 300 kV microscope that lends itself to this, and we'll go over that uh, in the afternoon, especially. However, it's not just these microscopes at uh, these KVs. There are one megavolt instruments. There was a one megavolt. I don't know. Maybe it's still being used up in Albany. Uh, you know, it was you know at least a decade or a decade, two decades ago, already in existence. Um, Japan. I don't know if this is still in use. They had a three megavolt. Right. So you can go quite high in energy. And these are for more uh, particular use cases. They tend to be more on the material side, but also some people that are looking at very, very thick samples. You see you have more energy, you have more penetration, but you have all, also more uh, electron radiation damage. So it's a balance. So then why was a particular KV chosen? There are compromises and there are certain reasons for it, but don't think that there's only one KV uh, out there, and there's a, a full range. I mentioned vacuum a little bit, and so this goes into the discussion. So we have our electrons going really, really fast. Why do we need the vacuum? Well, our, you could sort of think of it as, imagine you have a light bulb. Some microscopes would be tantamount to everything put inside of a light bulb. So if your filament electron source and detector, et cetera, is in a light bulb, and you break vacuum in a light bulb and you turn it on, you still will have light. It just might not uh, last that long. It will probably burn out really rapidly. So one thing would be to ensure uh, our source would be to make sure we have a very good vacuum. Um, and here's the calculation. So beam coherence at, you know, if we have a normal electron beam going through uh, air, uh, yeah, you probably can't get through more than a centimeter, but in vacuum, we can go meters and we don't have too much change in the electron wavelength or energy. So also there's a situation where we put our sample in the microscope and we want to limit contamination, All right? So a vacuum can help with that. It also provides insulation for our particular samples, we want to be at cryogenic temperatures, uh, and that becomes a challenge to maintain a vitrified state all through. So we need a vacuum. How do we achieve that vacuum? We have a whole host of pumps from pre-vacuum pumps that might be rotary pumps, diffusion pumps like oil diffusion, as mentioned earlier, turbo pumps, basically a big fan, and the pumps that we have, especially on our FIG systems, are ion getter pumps. IGPs, it's basically a box with getter material on the side and you have a, a few thousand volts. If there's any ion whatsoever, it gets slammed to the side. But that doesn't work if you have air because you have too many ions, you would saturate your pump. So typically what you have is you have it sort of this order that you normally you know, have a pre-vacuum pump pumping down a diffusion pump, pumping down a turbo, pumping down the IGP. Sometimes you might skip a diffusion pump depending on the type of PVP turbo configuration. But that's very important because if 
the vacuum state is not known, you don't want to use the microscope. And the microscope won't last too long if you have a suboptimal vacuum state. Typically, when you have a side entry system, you're going in and out, you're breaking vacuum. You know, there's no way around that. But what vacuum do you want? Depends if you want pores or pascals. You're around this range. Basically, inside the microscope is near Earth space. That's the vacuum you want to achieve, especially near your fig. There are differential apertures. For example, your fig your, uh, tends to be really, really high vacuum, somewhere from 10 to the minus 7 to the minus 9 pascal. And then when you get to your projection chamber, you actually might be you know, two or three orders of magnitude lower. So it's not the same vacuum throughout the microscope. The microscope may display this information either in units or in logs. It's just easy shorthand because it might be easier to say like, okay, this log is useful. It may not necessarily correspond to the absolute vacuum level, the absolute pressure. So just make note of that. And if you're really curious, you can dig in, but this will further highlight that our gun is a really tight vacuum, whereas our, our camera can be a lower vacuum. There tends to be several different vacuum systems, but I'll highlight the Creos instrument. We have a sample loader on the left, an auto loader system that has a sec separate vacuum system than the column on the right. So in concert, the vacuum systems are used in conjunction to each other, but there are certain modules or certain areas that can be isolated and they have their separate vacuum systems. Of course, it has to be a parity because if we're not uh, achieving a certain threshold, we can't conjoin certain uh, modules within the microscope, otherwise we'll break vacuum. Something that is of interest would be, well, how large is the column, meaning the space that an electron is going through? I don't know if you see, down the center, that circle, that's the diameter of the column. It's not that large. Occasionally you get to certain areas like the octagon. Uh, what you see on the right is the, what we call the octagon and the sample heart holder for an auto grid. And that's large, right? So like there's certain areas where you can add, you know, EDAX detectors, other ports and other modifications onto the microscope like the octagon, that's a, a large volume. But the rest of the column, is very small. If you see all the way on the left, you can sort of see that green uh, you know, electronics board that's for a lens. And in the very center, that's also a very small uh, you know, pinhole as it were. That again, that's the column, right? So that's what we, that's the true part. So then why is there so much space? Well, the lenses, the magnet the coils can be around like this big. That's like a lens all the way from like this diameter. And you need a lot of lead shielding. I, I mentioned electrons, but our electron sources do kick out a bit of x-rays. And there's a whole bunch of lead in the microscope to prevent that. And don't worry, there's almost no radiation. We have a Geiger counter. Um, it's already tested, there's, you know, but there is need of lead. So if you have certain energies from our electron source, it's not just electrons that are being kicked off. So now we have lenses, that's the next topic. So just like our glass lenses, you know, glass bends light, magnets bend electrons. Our lenses can focus, magnify, but they also rotate the image. So you think about the right-hand rule, you have an electron going through a magnet, and that's why you may have noticed your electron microscope has set magnifications. It's not a continuous magnification microscope. It can be, but that's more for ease of use because if you're looking at your image and you have an intermediate mag, it can actually be rotating. And so that's why we have set mags that we can then see that it's more or less roughly aligned. So there are extensions of that. You, depending on where you're projecting, you might have a different lens series on certain microscopes and you just might want extra lenses if you're doing some technique development. During the afternoon, I want you to really interrogate your instructors and go over uh, the microscope parts. Microscope alignments will come, we'll also have some, uh, some time on Thursday, but the idea would be when you get to the microscope, what is your responsibility? What is an operator responsibility? What is staff responsibility? 
some facilities, you get a compass to all the above and are expected to be a super user. So then uh, lenses are the, the main um, area of the microscope that you're interacting with really when you get to the microscope, uh, trying to align it, which you might not actually be aligning it, you might just be conditioning it. Usually there are several sets of alignments. There's a factory set of alignments, there's an engineer alignment, there could be a couple of engineer alignments, and then there's you know, the, you know, the supervisor alignments, and then there are the direct alignments. So therefore, what people call alignments could actually not really be alignments because it's already aligned. You're just trying to make sure that the beam is going down the optical axis and hitting your, your detector. So it's more, depending on your terminology, it could be conditioning uh, the microscope for use. And the idea is you wanna go from top to bottom from your source all the way down to your detector. Uh, there are certain things uh, that are advantages for configurations and packages. Uh, we have a whole bunch of apertures. We have to uh, take note that there is a condenser lens, but then there's a condenser aperture. There is an objective lens and there's objective aperture. So some people get confused and you're pointing at the aperture and talking about the lens and vice versa. Usually when we're talking about um, doing some of the alignments, we're putting the aperture, centering it, and making sure we reduce stagnation. Depending on where your crossovers are, your crossovers might not be exactly at the lens or your aperture might not actually be at the crossover. And you might see something like this, uh, fringes, vanilla fringes. So that there is a modification, especially in the objective system, where you can modify the objective such that the crossover is directly through that beam path and you might hear it as fringe-free illumination. And therefore you, you don't see these sort of ripples and you can collect closer to it you, or more data closer to the edge is useful. And you can shrink your beam smaller and smaller size. One way to get around that is you just expand your beam and the ripples are so far away from the center. However, then you're burning huger swaths of your specimen. But whatever you do, make sure there's a way to undo. <laughs> Uh, you want to be careful when uh, certain things are permanent and take pause for that. I would have to say the biggest worry for an electron microscope is environment, and that's temperature. When I was giving a tour, I was alluding to we don't want more than one degree Celsius movement per day, no more than 0.4 degrees Celsius per hour. Otherwise, especially when you're trying to reach high resolution, you'll see a lot of hysteresis. Um, there needs to be a particular uh, configuration where your lenses are not too warm or too cold compared to the room. Your lenses can actually condense uh, humidity even though it's bone dry from the room and that could hurt the electronics. You wanna make sure not just the room is pretty stable, the bulk of the heat load coming from the microscope is actually being dumped into a water loop and your lenses are primarily cooled by this water loop, as well as your camera. So the environment also entails that anything that's supporting the microscope and the water loop is, has to be very, very stable. Last thing in this row would be detectors. Direct detectors especially are the, um, are the, the choice of instrument that we wanna use. We have CCDs, we have CMOS, some of the older micro, Microscopes, they have a phosphor screen um, or a scintillator. So electrons kick out photons. And then we're actually with fiber optics reading the photons. So some of the older microscopes that you have oculars with, that's what you could see. CMOS detectors are a little bit more modern where you, especially with the readout, every single um, area has a little transistor that you can read out. It is better for signal to noise. It does not necessarily need a phosphor screen if you're talking about direct detector. Not all CMOS detectors are direct detectors. Direct detectors, however, are CMOS. They make use of that technology. And yeah, I don't think there's a direct sensing CCD. Well, I, I guess it could be. You just burn it out after one shot. Um, very expensive. So the idea of cameras, you're talking about SNR, that's the DQE. You're talking about the characteristic of the sensor, that's the MTF. Something to make note, the DQE will be flux dependent. 
So there's something called coincidence loss. So if you turn up, turn up your electron flux, you'll have so many electrons falling down the column and your frame rate of your camera could be slow that you're recording more than one event in a particular pixel. So if you see curves like these, they tend to also say like, what's your accelerating voltage or what's your electron flux because your DQE will, will change and vary depending on that. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears now, leave microscopes and shift to the other part that we're gonna be covering in the afternoon. We'll get you hands-on sample prep. So instead of seeing the devices, the idea is that you now actually you make use of the devices. And what do we wanna do for sample prep? I mentioned that we have a certain resolution range that we can achieve and reach using electron microscope. We have several different modalities of EM, electron crystallography, SBA, electron tomography. These three modalities can use the same microscope. It requires different sample prep, different processing. What is your sample? It could be pleomorphic, like cells. It could be very homogeneous, like a purified macromolecule. What do you want to do with your sample? Well, it depends what you're set up to do and what you're comfortable. We're going to be focusing on the single particle workflow, but here's an example from, you can go from crystals, the single particles, it's all the way down to cells. The single particle workflow tends to focus on this particular pathway and it joins again in that structural biology continuum of NMR and X-ray, you know? So again, this is just one tool and it should be used in concert. Now you've seen this, the idea is I have a macromolecule of interest in solution. Most of biology is in solution and we have to get it very thin. We have to thin it down to get into a form factor that is compatible with electron microscope. Again, since you know why we use electrons, you know that if your sample is too thick, we can't penetrate. There are many different devices to thin out your sample. We typically use three microliters per grid and we throw away most of it because we need the, the thin, thin sample. So that's an example on the lower right of what an EM grid would look like after it's been plunge frozen, maybe not from that device. And we put in the microscope and we image it. And this is a common workflow that we'll get to pretty soon, uh, tomorrow especially, to learn how to deal with these images, which are projections of your 3D molecule and how to analyze that into a 3D reconstruction, if not model. So these are examples of grids. Uh, sometimes they look better, sometimes they look worse. I will say both these examples, despite them looking pretty bad, were able to both give rise to three angstrom reconstructions. It, does, it doesn't necessarily mean the, the one on the left is very efficient, but it can be done. So what are grids? Why do we call grids grids? Well, it's because it's usually in, it's a three millimeter disc made out of metal. There's a bunch of different metals that can be used. Copper is the most common. It is very easy to work with, and that's why it's most common. Gold is also another very common one because it's inert. It's very compatible to uh, cell biology. Uh, gold grids were used, you know, decades ago, actually, uh, because there are a lot, the traditional EM, when we're back in blobs, was a huge contention of tomography. So we're doing room temperature tomography. We're growing cells and doing things like that. It's more recent that we've switched to cryo tomography. So um, I think if you talk to anyone from the EM uh, side, the form factors of grids were designed this way decades ago, and that was for use primarily for room temperature tomography, especially the one on the upper left, the slot grid. So there's something where you just have one opening, and that was four sections, and you put in, and um, and you can just, you know, serial section, and you can get serial tomograms, and you can reconstruct, you know, whole organisms or like worms, which are small, but uh, that's the case. Uh, more recent times have we made use of what the traditional grid is. It's just a whole bunch of grids, um, grid squares on, um, on a metal mesh, and they can be hexagonal. Finder grids 
which is this form factor. Um, it was also very common and that was coming out of the room temperature tomography field because let's say you do light microscopy then you do EM, you wanna make sure you match. So this has all been redone in modern times with cryo techniques. And that's why you'll be hearing a resurgence of a lot of these techniques that we used to do and were sort of stopped because we didn't hit the resolution revolution yet. So again, with grids, there's many different form factors, many different materials, and I'm sure there are companies that even can make a grid out of whatever material you're looking for. I'm gonna go quickly through this, uh, but it's on the slide, but the idea is like, why do you hear 300, 400 mesh? It doesn't mean there's 300 or 400 squares, it's related to pitch. And so that's, that's why when you're counting, go how many, how many squares are in our 400 mesh? Well, that you have to do a little bit of math and you can look up the manufacturer to see like, well, how thick are the grid bars? How thick are the grid squares, et cetera. So I'm going to further go into terminology. So what I'll be calling the grid is the three millimeter metal mesh. The foil is what's gonna go on top of the grid. There are gold grids with carbon foil and there are gold grids with gold foil. And so you have to be very specific what you're talking about because especially if you're going to particular areas that are doing development, that could vary and that could matter. There are certain materials, especially for the foil that are relatively electron transparent. For example, graphene, especially if you have very thin graphene can let roughly 99% of electrons through. There's uh, silicon nitride. There are other types of films and foils that you can put on a grid, depending on what you wanna do. We tend to use carbon because it's very easy to help align a microscope, but that's not always the case. And the foil themselves can have a varying pattern on them. Holy carbon is something that is used in cryo quite often because we don't want to image through carbon. If you're doing negative stain, the limitation of your resolution is bounded by the stain grain. And that's why carbon is relatively transparent relative to stain, but it has quite a bit of signal. Now, if you're moving from nanometers to angstroms, then you actually want to image in a hole. And these form factors may be useful. So you have different hole sizes, different hole spacing. In the middle row is lacy carbon, where you have different ranges of sizes. Uh, they do have some regular array patterns with different size holes. Typically people use uh, uniform size and spacing because it helps with automation because you have a regular array. But uh, if, if what's in panel B is better for your protein, et cetera, the only limitation is that most of our automation programs don't deal with panel B very well. It deals with panel A so that you might take the hit of you know, not being the best for your protein as long as you collect more images. So just make note of whatever you're trying to optimize, uh, you wanna make sure it's sustainable. So talking about sample thickness, it really depends on what your sample is because if your sample is thick and you wanna image all of it, you may not wanna thin it out any more than you can. But then you may have to compromise and thin it out because otherwise you won't get enough detail. So what we tend to want to do to make our samples is we go through uh, a transition where we take our sample in buffer, in a nice standard pressure and room temperature and try to frozen hydrate it. Uh, and that's called vitrification. We tend to want to vitrify very, very fast. That way we don't have hydrogen bonding there are many, many forms of ice. Some forms of ice are not very productive, especially like hexagonal ice, where you'll crush your sample, right? There's a lot of strain and stress. So you want to have this nice glass-like ice. There have been questions on how fast you want to freeze. You may have a situation where you freeze slower, 
that allows stresses to relax and might be better for your sample. And there are other situations where you want to freeze extremely fast. But there's a whole host of devices to assist you. And I want to point out that something that we'll be talking more about are Crowley and badges. The National Center Program has created standards and best practices. One advantage of earning a merit badge is that it demonstrates your proficiency and is cross honored at another center. However, no matter what standards and best practices are out there, they're just a foundation. It's not to say there's only one way of uh, sample freezing. So a worry that we've had a lot of people like, okay, this is the way you taught me how to freeze. So this is the only way to freeze. That is not the case. This is to demonstrate you have a certain level of proficiency such that then you can take that and play and move forward because there could be a situation where your sample does not follow the standard one, two, three steps. But as you heard, we have a lot of uh, partners, not just Crowd VR, but Crowd 101. And throughout the day, we'll highlight more about these Crowd Mirror badges. So let's look at the sample. So your sample is now in solution, it's bouncing all around. And here is a hypothetical scenario of what's happening. So we putting our sample on a grid, we hope that it spreads. Then we blot away a particular layer to help thin it. And the sample is bouncing around and we freeze it. And hopefully that this is a useful sample for imaging. But what happens? Well, depending on what, uh, what your protein is and how you're blotting, it may not be an ideal scenario. Uh, the upper right would be an ideal scenario where you would have one layer of macromolecule and very little uh, buffer. More often than not, what you'll see is that there'll be interactions uh, whoops, of your sample with your, your uh, not only grid, but the air-water interface. Something that you're trying to do is go from a low surface area, high volume, to a low volume. Oh, did I get it backwards? So yeah, low surface area, high volume, to low volume, high surface area. And that may or may not be compatible with most proteins. And you might see something like this. Uh, Alex Noble has done quite a bit of work on this where you just look at single particle samples, take homograms, where are your particles lying? And it was not known before that because we had a thought that the upper right was more frequent than we thought. And that is really underscoring why we want thin samples because we might have multi-layer samples. And if you think about our imaging, we're imaging in transmission and we're imaging uh, in projection. And if we have, we have a certain sort of electron and free mean path, but if the sample exceeds that, then we have a varying Z height that we're not necessarily accounting for. So there are a whole bunch of grids that we've mentioned, and there are different form factors. You might apply your sample to one side or the other. This we know as cryo wells. Something that is also very interesting, how many people have looked at what a frozen grid looks like? And we have an idea. Fortunately, there have been people that have been putting vitrified grids into an SEM and looking not just one side, but the back side. And you can see that it's not as uniform as one might think. Uh, we've done that here, and other people have done that uh, primarily because uh, we also have been working on nanowire grids. And uh, this analysis was to look at, like, well, if the nanowires are pulling sample away, well, where is the sample going? But that's something of use of interest to say, well, we have a vision of what's happening, what's happening in reality, and how will that help me? I'm going to wrap up pretty soon to say that this is all part of the EM workflow and how do you want to optimize. So one side is knowing the tools, meaning the electron microscope. But the electron microscope, if you test the info limit, they can all go pretty high in resolution. Something that is more near control would be samples and sample optimization. And this is something that we will hopefully 
get into more of in the afternoon. So the reason why I want to end early is that what's going to happen after every lecture is we'll have a roundtable discussion, and hopefully this will open it up. We can talk a little bit about the resources we have here. But the idea of the round table would be making use of EM resources. This can extend to a discussion of anything I've talked before. But the reason why we're in a unique position, you can see we have a regional center, national center, and an international outreach all in one location. So in some terms, um, we are the, the regional center from some, for some national center users locally. And how is that interplay being done here on a small scale, as well as what may come into play at your home institution? So, but before I get into that, anyone have questions on particular topics that I just briefly cover? The reason for covering these topics is that when you go into the afternoon and you start interacting with your instructors, you have talking points and you have uh, things to be curious about. Uh, the instructors, are really there to help and they'll, they'll try to show you certain things. But if you have more focused ideas of what will be useful, it'll make the whole experience better. Okay. Any questions? Yes, here. On the previous slide, what is the cube? A cube is a tabletop SEM. And it's great for looking at grids. We, we do quite a bit of technique development in terms of uh, grids and grid foils, and you want to now analyze that. This cube uh, is literally tabletop, which will be about this size. Uh, you might have seen it, it's right across from Spotted On, and that's that. Uh, it also, so that small little door is the chamber since it pumps down really fast. It also has an EDAX detector. So let's say you want to know, um, uh, let's say you're doing graphene grids or you're doing metal coating, you want to know your coverage, you want to know a little bit more about what's going on. This can give you a hint of that. Uh, most of our microscopes here are not set up for elemental analysis, et cetera, because it's tuned for biological samples. Um, this is more on the material side. But especially if you're trying to go after more unique form factors of grids, so we make gold grids here, we make graphene grids, we also make continuous carbon. We do a lot, lot of things here. Uh, and that's why that tabletop SEM is really useful. So you uh, screen like, yeah, if you make graphene grids, you want to say you want to see how thick your gold is. You can always turn it on an angle and you can see how thick your gold is. Um, you want to have outreach with uh, students and they can bring in bugs. You can, you can gold coat them and you do like, so it's, it's an SEM. It's really good. It just looks at the surface, but uh, there are fun things to do with it. But there are also real research things that we do uh, day in, day out. But this, the cube is one of the best outreach tools for microscopy, especially for K through 12 STEM, because you can just bring in whatever off the street and like, oh, can I look at this? And I guess we can look at that. Uh, here's microscopy. Now let's get into what you can use that for in terms of biology. So you, that's a sort of a segue and that's very useful. And that's the whole point. You can sort of see this course where we were doing this quite often, where we introduce a topic and we try to get you deeper and deeper and deeper. There has to be a hook. Um, and I would say in terms of teaching and analysis, the cube is great, but most people care about the top row. <laughs> So from a K through 12, you go from that cube SCM well, straight you, into creosis. Yeah, of course. That's a, that, that's the workflow. <laughs> uh, there might be a few more steps depending. Uh, but you never know. We, we've, we've had a few beginners that uh, sight unseen. They plunge froze a grid, and they're just magic grids. Um, so uh, sometimes you'll take luck. Maybe it's skill combined, but luck and skill together, dangerous combination. Uh, Suzanne? Yeah, just one question. What is actually really the difference between the nano wire and the regular grids? Are they made like, because wire is usually like pulled, right? So, uh, so, uh, so, so we, made it made differently. So the, there's a protocol that's already published. So if you use ammonium for sulfate and copper, the, 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 the solution, chemical solution will interact with the copper mm -hmm. and it'll grow extensions, what we're calling wires and the hairy grids. And so if you incubate a copper grid in, in the solution, uh, these extensions will keep on growing. The longer you incubate, the more they'll grow. And eventually they'll grow so long that they'll, they'll be brittle and they can't handle the stress and they'll just snap. 
And so the longer you have it, the more dense they will become. So it's a chemical reaction uh, that's interacting with the copper. Grid, though, it's a pre-made grid. So you get a copper grid and then you dunk oh, it in the solution. The no, you put it in the solution and they grow. So they're actually made out of the grid bars. So you, you take a copper grid, you dunk it in the solution and uh, they interact with the copper grid bars and oh, they so extend the the, and they grow. The 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 Correct. Okay. But like on the chameleon, they have this nanofiber, they made differently, right? The nanofibers on the chameleon because they don't look like this. Uh, right, they, they were optimizing the protocol because they're trying to scale it. So uh, versus, so it's the same idea, but they probably have made some efficiencies to make it mass producible. So there's certain things that you can do. Uh, I would say like, let's say you do tissue culture and you, you know, have a plate that's a little bit different than yeah. if you say like, okay, now I want 10 liters of it. It's like, well, okay, well, I, I can do many plates or there's different ways of scaling. Uh, can you grow grids uh, or cells in suspension? And that's a very different protocol, but in the heart, it's the same uh, components and same idea. So the idea from scaling and manufacturing process, uh, you have to ask the company how, how they do it. They've decided to do less sparse nanowires, and I think that's easier for them to control. Um, but it's more matched to their device too, because the device, the chameleon protocol is slightly different than the spotted on protocol. And that's why the grids are not interchangeable. They have to be matched per device. And what's the advantage of the nanowires? I think Chase moves them to wick, right? To the nanowires are only useful because you don't have to use blotting paper to thin out samples. Yeah, because they wick. They wick. Yeah, okay. Right. So this is an alternative form. It's called blot-free vitrification. So the normal way you vitrify is you add three microliters and you come with something, whether it's natural cellulose, glass, uh, fiber, or whatnot, and you, you slam it against the side and you, you remove this nanowires pull there's another way of doing that and that's applying very little sample that is just naturally thin and vitrifying like there's these uh, uh what do you call it pds chips um that are the spray and then the the other way would be a crowd writer where you have a capillary and you just apply a very thin film and you plunge so there's different ways of it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, so there's, I didn't get into that. There's, but there's a field called blot free vitrification where you don't use blotting paper and create a thin film. The advantage of that is that, uh, again, you're, you're not uh, smashing filter paper onto your grid. Also, the filter paper could be contaminated. Uh, some filter papers have trace metals. And especially if you're working with a channel and transporter, that can be deleterious unless you pre treat because you, you move on the me reaction mechanism. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, the pencil paper is showing that you get some to the extra resolution off of a few months of paper. So, uh, I guess, could you speak to. You need a very good environment, you need a very good sample. Um, so, uh, an Arctica, for example, can reach sub two. Uh, you need a, a good camera. It must be a direct detector on that as well. And I would have to say, if you took that sample and put it into Creos, what would the resolution be? Has anyone done that comparison? I I don't think that systematically no, but my my suspicion would be they would probably even obtain better resolution. So I mean. No Example where a lower is a better use scenario. Right? Okay, so this is something that I didn't go through. There's a reason for that. So the the reason for that are our detectors. If you go and look, uh, I think Chris Russo has a paper uh, talking about KV um, and Richard Henderson especially. 100 KV may actually be better trade-off in terms of energy and information received. Unfortunately, we don't have a detector. Our direct detectors work better at higher KVs to directly detect uh, electrons. I bet, so a uh, direct detector works better at 300 than 200. It might probably work better at 400 and 300 even. 
uh, if we had those microscopes. And the reason for something called back thinning, so we had a, a sensor on the direct detector, and the problem is the sensor was used to be thick. When an electron hit, we had like shot noise, like secondary, we could have secondary events, like it could hit here and then trigger here. Okay, so then you back thin it, so you make it very thin, and the idea is that it just passes through once. Now, if you get a lower KV, slower energy, then you get into the same idea where it might interact with the sensor because it's going slower and slower, and it's not only hitting a pixel once. So there's something called a hybrid pixel detector. Dectris is trying to make it. It's probably only 512 by 120. I don't know. It's really small right now. It, it's, it's not uh, commercial yet. That is tuned to 100 kV. So there are 100 kV detectors. They tend to have a scintillator on there. So they're not really tuned to 100 kV. Uh, they, there's a material that kicks it down versus a direct detector. Um, so the hybrid pixel detector would be able to directly detect at that KV with good SNR. Now, if that was commercial, you may see a situation where a grid would be better at a lower KV now, but it's a limitation of current technology why uh, most likely 100 KV is, is not as high resolution as 200, it's not as high as 300, as if you look at the EMDB uh, deposited, because the amount of effort you would need as you go lower KV is very, very high. Um, and you, you're trying to compensate for the lack of hardware. So the damage of your sample less, which is probably why there's more information lower energy. That's the interaction. But the detectors right. are capable right now. So also, you would need a very, very thin sample because let's say you're going after a thick sample, it might not penetrate. So uh, there, one size does not fit all. There have been talks about like, what is the best thickness for your sample, and that can matter. And that could also be impacted by your grid type. You have a different hole size and spacing. There is actually an optimal ice thickness depending on your hole size to reduce motion that could come from the drumming effect or the, the beam induced motion effect from the grid foil itself. So it's a compromise. So most peer, people just empirically determine whatever is useful. There is a theoretical rule of thumb that can help you um, and guide you, but uh, people, people have different preferences and they do all, all of the above. Again, if, if you're skillful and lucky, uh, again, a dangerous combination. <laughs> okay. So the so it's like uh, if you if you think back if you uh, had a you know a slot and you send light through because electrons are not just a particle it's a wave and then when you're going through any aperture you'll see secondary events so um, the idea though is if your crossover is exactly at that opening then you'll have less interaction with it so it's not no interaction so there so even if your crossover is there. You, you'll, you'll still have a little bit because it's not perfect. Uh, but the idea is if you limit the number of fringes such that it's right at the edge, then you can shrink your beam and you can have a larger sensor uh, or the sensor could cover the beam or vice versa. Uh, but I can show you like, that. if I find a physics book, that might be a, an optics book would be better because like they have the example where they, you have something going through one slat or you have like two slats and you can see the interference pattern uh, coming from that, even though like it, it's only going through like one opening, but you'll see the you know the other events going through. Uh, again, I'm more a conceptual person. I yeah, you know, I did do a bit of uh, physics, but I'm my math is not the strongest suit. Tomorrow you're going to meet Fred Sigelworth, and he will be able to give you more foundational math, and that's why I reserved it for him because he can explain a whole lot better than I can mathematically. But conceptually, I can uh, show you. I'm more visual. That's why I'm my cross this. Well, Will <laughs> or, or Sarah, do you want to go? Um, well, I was going to ask about grid. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like a question. Yeah, it's about energy. Yeah, so okay. Um, I was just going to ask for grids that are like lacy grids or grassy grids. When would you tried uh, the easy route and it didn't work for you, and then you had to do something else, and that was easy for you. The next easiest thing. Okay, so 
So this would be a matter of like, if you cannot optimize the IT thickness, then you might try a different type of grid or- Right, your ice thickness can be affected by your viscosity. So how concentrated things are, um, your mesh size, your, your hole size and spacing, uh, how long you block, how much you uh, prepare your grid, meaning plasma clean, grid treat it. Um, and I, I will run out of fingers if I saw your size. So all that can affect. So for some people, uh, a param one parameter is easier to adjust than another. Okay, if you're saying your grids are way too thick and I blotted uh, 10 seconds and they're still too thick, while you're running out of range, that's appreciable. Like, so whether you blot like three seconds or 10 seconds um, and it's still too thick, well, okay, that parameter, you've hit a wall. So the physical uh, plunge freezer blotting will not affect uh, the parameter you're going after. Okay, then you would have to look, can you change your sample? No, my sample will crash out anything else I do. Okay, can I then change my grid type or can I treat my grid differently? Um, I would go after that. If there is a particular rationale, like I've done plunge freezing and I did a tomogram, uh, all my particles are on the air water interface and I can see they're all denaturing at the air water interface because I can see it. Uh, then you might say, well, then I have to protect my sample and not have an air water interface, but maybe a buffer graphene interface. And that may help. And then the other interface one blotting away and it's so quick that uh, Yes, it's denatured, but it's stripped away. Um, so then that's a better approach. That's a rational approach because the other types of grids uh, tend to be a little more involved or they might be in short supply. Um, you may have overriding considerations. For example, my facility is set up for automation and I want gold grids. And so, so you could have started your project with edit whatever grid type, but you say, well, I'm gonna choose to optimize the gold grids because my facility can give me you know, 5,000, 8,000 images a day on gold grids. And even though the, you know, like let's say this is 80% good versus 100% good, well, the threefold more data makes 80% good viable enough. So you, that's the other crossover point. Like when do you brute force something versus like, well, I, I don't want to spend a month on the creos. It's just not economical. I'll, I'll have to work on my sample. Um, so I would say we would try the easiest first. Um, so we have a particular grid type that we prefer, but let's say you have 50 grid boxes of this grid type. I would say I would start there because you have the most resources. The worst thing would be I have 10 grids, they're magic. I use five for screening, it's backward one year. Oops, uh, I have five more chances to complete this project. And then I'm hoping my next project never needs this because I have to move on. So that's a real consideration. And it's more of a practical consideration that I shift you to. In an ideal world where resources are not an issue, then I would juxtapose um, what makes your sample happy and what gives you high throughput for data collection. Chitara? Chitra? Chitra? Uh, you wouldn't see it directly. You would have to, most of the screening has to be done through EM. So you would put it in an electron microscope and analyze it. So this is a discussion I briefly touched upon yesterday. Um, I just realized we're recording and no one can hear the questions and I didn't repeat them. So during the, the live stream, it would be, uh, be a little bit odd. Um, there's no orthogonal workflow for cryo-EM than cryo-EM itself. So if you're doing cryo-EM and you want to do screening, screening would be the workflow, but reduced and made more efficient. Let's say things might be binned. You might not use high resolution because you want greater field of view. You might use a different tier of microscope. Uh, it might be abbreviated data collection workflow, but it is the same workflow and it's time consuming. So I, I, a priori, we have yet to develop other techniques to say, I've plunged frozen a grid, I have cameras looking at how much I'm blotting, how fast it plunged, all this metrics, um, to then say, how well does it look like an electron microscope? 
I, I wish we had that. I mean, even crystallographers can put a crystal on a light microscope and have a good confidence that's at least not, not salt. We're just putting whatever we plunge freeze in the microscope and until we see it, we have no idea what we're looking at. And that's the reality and that's something we're, we're trying to get around. You, you dropped your question? No, I still have it. Okay, then. Ben. There are no uh, clear disadvantages. It's uh, one one event. Well, I don't, I don't know. Like there is none. It's just maybe time consuming to make, or maybe you can't get high enough supply. Um, I would say if you don't have to do anything and it, a grid works out of the box, is that better or not better? It's more of a personal choice. So this is something that is a matter of convenience. Some labs I know as a matter of course, the first thing they try is use graphing grids because they just use graphing grids. Uh, some uh, labs only use gold grids, like gold foil, gold grids. And that's the first thing they try because the, what's wrong with doing that? Because Chris Russo has shown that, you know, you can lower your beam induced motion because if your foil material matches your grid material during thermal contraction, you will have less stresses. So it's, it's a lot better. That's why molybdenum grids were in existence because the thermal contraction for carbon and molybdenum is roughly, roughly the same. Uh, so there, uh, I mean, I think the only other thing would be if your lab is not set up because graphene is very hydrophobic and you need to treat it. So plasma cleaning may not be sufficient. You might have to use UV ozone treatment and not every lab has a UV ozone coder. Uh, so th that's more of a personal consideration and uh, infrastructure consideration. But let's say you've worked on a particular sample that graphene was great. You probably set up your lab doing graphene. And then that's the first thing a lot of people try because people start with what they trust. Uh, is that good or bad? No, that's, that could be smart if that's the particular field you're working on in a class of proteins. For us, the reason why we have all of the above is because we don't know what we're going to get. I mean, yes, we test on apiferidin, and like, that's a sort of a gut check and a workflow check. Uh, but I'm, we have 16 students. I'm sure you have 16 different proteins, and uh, we might have more than eight different fields. So there might not be so many um, overlaps in terms of proteins. I have no idea how many fields, but you know, you'll have to tell me. Okay, so well, maybe you can ask your question. Um, you didn't mention the filters. I know that there's. Those are a big consideration in homology. Right. So I, I skipped it for single particle because energy filters tend not to make or break due to the fact most people thin their samples. Uh, there is a real consideration that the thicker your sample is, you have more inelastic scattering. Uh, and this is really useful for measuring eye sickness. So, yeah, yeah, so the thicker your sample, the more inelastic scattering you have. If you have an energy filter, then you can remove that, those unproductive signal and mo we're focused on elastic scattering. So the reason why tomographers are more interested in ESN effects because their natural targets tend to be cells and or organelles or if not tissues and they're thicker. So they'll have more inelastic scattering for single particle. Um, we can get away with a lot. So uh, if you're after one particle and the reconstruction, uh, then you would want you use sort of a, a list and he's like, I want it all because I'm going to be more efficient. Um, but if uh, you're just going single particle, you can uh, reference a paper from Rado doing GPCRs. He had with and without objective, with and without energy filter, things like that. For single particle, the variations are tenths of angstroms. But that's single particle. <laughs> and the reason being is your sample is so thin that uh, yes, does it impact? Yes, it does. But my sample is thin enough that it, the magnitude of impact is very low. Now, if your sample of interest are phages, are ribosome with elongation factors, then, then that is a cause for pause because now your sample thickness has to be greater because your, your molecule of interest is just a lot thicker than maybe an apiferidin or you know, 100 kilodalton uh, protein. And uh, what are energy filters? Well, just like light goes through a prism and you get a rainbow, you have an electron going through electronic prism and then you spread energy and you have something called a slit 
and you can say, I want orange, and you just move the slit to orange, and only orange goes through. Why is that useful? Your electron microscope has a high tension tank, and that's, let's say, putting out 300,000 volts. Every single Krios will say 300,000 volts. It's unlikely every single Krios in the world is putting out exactly 300,000 volts. Um, and there have been cases, especially the 200 kV paper, uh, where they reached below, they, they solved the CTF uh, correction not using 200. They varied it because their high tension tank might not necessarily be putting out that number. And that will help with correcting the envelope function from that because uh, we didn't get the map that's coming there. So like, it's like you think of the, the Fourier transform or the point spread function of a microscope as, as the CTF. And the reason why EM is a lot better is because you have amplitudes and phases, but when you're trying to merge data and you have uh, you know, different defoci, different parameters, then the only way to merge data properly is to CTF correct. Otherwise would be lost there. So then if you look at an energy filter, that helps bring your data more into that ideal because you're selecting only a particular wavelength because in that CTF equation, wavelength is a parameter. Uh, and if your wavelength has a bigger spread, not just from inelastic scattering, but because of that, then that decreases the data. But also, why don't we want inelastic scattering? Because if you have different energies, you can actually multiple project your signal and you may not be able to deconvolute that so uh, what is a normal energy filter slit width? We technically use 20 EV. Some people use less, some people use more. That's a good rule of thumb, so like 10 EV on each side. And so we have 300,000 volts plus and minus 10 EV. And that's more true to uh, you know, the signal and we would have better signal. And that would be better data. Another reason why, um, so better data, uh, removing elastic scattering, but the counterpoint, like, so why, why doesn't it matter again? Again, we, we tend not to be data limited. So most people in the single particle collect more data than they need. And so we have a lot of redundancy. So I, I you have to say is that some people are like, okay, let's say you collected a lot of data. What happens if you only use half of that for your processing when you achieve the same answer? And maybe you, you process the full data set you know, when it's reviewed, just so you have a better number, but what if you answered everything you needed within a particular period? So energy filters are quite useful. I think in single particle, we can get away without using it just because we're single particle. And yeah, it's just like a prism where you have electron going through an electron prism, you spread out. What happens if you don't put a slit in? Well, just like white light going through a rainbow, instead of just selecting orange, you select the whole rainbow, you get white light back. That depends though, that you have to calibrate your systems appropriately, right? So if your lens system is pointing your electron beam left and right, then, then you'll have a problem, but it's all things equal, assuming it's a perfect system, whatever goes in can come back out and you can make use of it or not make use of it. Uh, but some people have tried, uh, the best uh, comparison would be a pre-GIF um, detector and a post gift detector. Most energy filters are post column because it makes it modular. There is something called a mega filter, which is in column, and those are more stable. But there are different types. You either you make a column with making an energy filter in mind, or you put it as an add on on, on the bottom. Uh, but if you think of a prism, like when, when white light hits a prism and you get the rainbow, it, it has to bend. So most energy filters, you need at least a 90. The mega filters have a couple bends to, to make it work because you're, you're expecting it to go straight down the column at some point. Is there, pardon? Is there any cost? Well, you, you first have to get an energy filter uh, and that there's a cost for that, but is there, a cost for, in terms of diminishing your data quality or a cost in terms of, uh, if the energy filter is tuned, then there should be uh, advantages. If the energy filter is not tuned, then, okay, well then it's the same thing as a misaligned microscope. Uh, but you can always make the comparison. You don't have to 
you can go through the system, but you don't have to use the slit as it were. It's not a, a true with and without energy filter comparison, but it's a, uh, it can give you an indication on, on how impactful is it to remove an elastic scattering. It should track with your ice thickness, right? It, the, or your sample, right? So the thicker your sample, the more elastic scattering, the more impactful an energy filter would be. Okay, so then there's almost, I guess this, this is a type of round 